All right, today we're going to talk about the PID toolbox. I'm going to show you how to download it, get it installed, open it up, and go through all the options. Okay, I'll drop this link below in the video description, so check that out. This is the repo where Brian White has the PID toolbox. He's made some further developments to this, uh, honestly, a while ago. I have this video, I should have done this probably like a month ago, but haven't gotten to it yet, so let's knock it out. Gonna go to releases here, and then under here, uh, you can see the latest release of this video is 0.23. I actually have 0.20 on my computer right now, so let's go ahead and go through the process. I have a Windows PC, so I'm gonna go ahead and click this zip file. I'm just gonna open that zip file. Then that will open in a folder here. I can drill into the zip file itself. I can go to under main, and you can see this is really what I want right here under main. I'm going to right click on this and hit create new folder, PID toolbox, and then I'm gonna call this V0.23, hit enter, opened into that folder, grab this content, drag and drop it into here. So the key with this version is you can directly open logs now. You don't have to export them in the CSV file format and then open that. You can just click the log, but the log needs to be uh, in the same directory as these exe files. So make this folder somewhere, you know, right, maybe just right under your C drive or something like that. If you don't have MATLAB installed, you'll need to go ahead and follow these instructions, meaning you will need to go into the runtime installer file, extract that to your desktop somewhere, and go ahead and install that program. That This is a MATLAB coded project, so it needs that little add-on if you don't have MATLAB installed. And you can see item one here if you do have MATLAB. But I'm gonna assume 99.9% you know, .9 of us do not have MATLAB installed. Now what I like to do as a Windows user from here, since this is a folder that's kind of buried a little bit for me, and you're gonna to have to grab and put logs in there. If I, you right click on the directory, wherever it may be, then you go up to include in library and you can hit create new library. And that will do a special library item here, just like you have for videos and some other things. And then you can just click on this and this will basically, it's always up here at the top and you can click this and it takes you right to that directory. Now I've thrown a couple of logs in here that I have and from here we're just gonna launch the PID toolbox. Again, typically I'd make an icon, put it on my desktop, so you can right click on this uh, to hit create shortcut, and that would make a shortcut on your desktop. Once it fires up, and it can take about 30 seconds for it to open, I gotta load that application background, I guess the runtime application, and fire up the program, so just be patient. Then you can see you can select two different files here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select file A. I'm gonna hit the browse button here. And you can see here what I have is I have two flights. This is the same uh, quadcopter, this is the dual rig stack where I have a SP Racing F7 dual board and a iFlight F7 twin G board in the same rig. So it's the exact same flight, they arm at the exact same time, everything. So the SP Racing board was the main board that actually flew the quad, so I'm going to go hit pick that for number one. Then I'm going to hit browse again and I'm going to go pick the iFlight board, which was the one above it, as the second one here. And then after I just select both of those, then I'll hit load and run. Now this load and run will bring up a dialogue and you'll see the progression of it. It can take a while, so go grab a cup of coffee. You can see the progression bar starts to open right here and it's opening the log and exporting to CSV. So it's doing all the same operations, it's just doing it for us. Okay, after it loads them up, you can see both logs here in front of you. So you have the uh, roll, pitch, and yaw axis on log file A, roll, pitch, and yaw on log file B. You can trim and extend. So say I wanted to just look at a section where I was doing some prop wash moves. So say that was from like, I don't know, uh, let's just do 70 to maybe uh, 85. So I could do 70 to 85 seconds and then 70 to 85 on the below one as well. And you would want to do that if you're specifically trying to compare like one setup on the same quad to another setup, basically like you made some changes in the PIDs or filters or something, and you really wanted to look at the prop wash and see which is better. Well, there's a PID error analyzer right here, but you really kind of need to narrow it down. You can't have um, the full flight. I mean, you can, it's just, if it's the same rig and you're doing the exact same moves, then that's a big, you know, you can compare the two things. With pit error, uh, honestly, a sharp flip or roll to the left or the right, unless you have 
your feed forward pretty high and you're specifically tuned that, which I'm going to show in a video in a little bit, uh, to make sure your gyro is tracking a set point. For example, if you compare one log, say you don't have that set well, and you'd have compare one log versus another and you do the full flight, but then in one log you do four flip or rolls, and then the first log you only did one or two, well then the pit error on the second one is just going to be bigger just because you did more flips or rolls. So you can use these things to kind of trim it down to specific sections of the log. Uh, that's very handy. You can't do that in plasma tree. You can do that with the pit toolbox. The other thing we can do here is you can click on any one of the axes. So if I click on an axis here and you can zoom in. So you have these tools here. I can zoom in in a certain section of the of the flight and you can see on, across the top here I can turn on my D term, I can turn on my set point and I can kind of start looking at this. Now uh, honestly it is a little bit more easy to navigate in Black Box Explorer so I don't use this that much but it is there. Do know that you have this info toolbox here as well so I can click this little info um, tool, click on one of the traces or near a trace and it will give me some information about what roll rate that is, uh, what seconds at that log, and then you know what the roll rate is. So I can kind of click around with that uh, if you wanted to. To clear that out, you just right click on here and hit delete all uh, data stamps. And click on that again. To get back out of this view, you must have all these unchecked up here and then just click in the white space and that will click you back out and then you can click into another one pretty easily. Again, click back out. You can see across the top here which log, log A, which log, log B. Uh, you can at any time select another log and hit run. So if I would select another log for A or B and hit run, it will only load the new one that I selected. So if I don't change B, it won't reload B, which is kind of nice. And then you can just see a quick graphic down here of the general throttle. To get the time frame out uh, longer again, I just usually type in two and then it's two. It, it automatically trims in two seconds from the end of the flight too. I'm a little fuzzy on that, so I'm just going to go to 160 here. It would be nice, Brian if there would be a button here to hit like reset time limits or something so that might be a nice addition. You can see uh, info uh, on the log itself kind of like the header data which you could again see in Black Box Explorer or you can hit save figure it would save whatever you have shown here so if you clicked in on one and zoomed in and showed different traces and wanted to show somebody something you could hit save figure and it saves that out. When it saves that it's going to save that into a folder it makes a folder here for whatever the first log is that you have open here and then you can it would save those figures in here or however many you do save wherever you hit this save figure button because there's other windows that have the same thing there. The tools here on the left are different tools you have so you have the spectrum analyzer so I'm going to go ahead and click on that and just show that. So very much so in Black Box Explorer it's kind of the same thing here you can click on any trace and it will uh, show you a spectrum of it, but it's going to give you a waterfall graph that's actually added into the newest version of Black Box Explorer. I'm going to do a video on that shortly as well. The so waterfall graph, it shows you the vibrations, but it also shows you in relation to what throttle percentage. So typically what I like to set up here is I do my gyro unfiltered, gyro filtered, then my D-term unfiltered, and then D-term filtered. And then I can look at that, or if I'm looking in this case, let's do gyro filtered, unfiltered, let's do A, and then we're going to do that unfiltered and filtered on B. Uh, when you're done here, you can uh, hit run. Uh, also, before we hit run here, notice that it's actually calculating the amount of phase delay it's reading based on the gyro traces. So you can see that the SP Racing had a, it shows like it's having a little bit more average phase delay for some reason. It really should be the same. Um, and then the um, iFlight board here. That one looked like the average measurement of phase delay was a little, little bit less. Do keep in mind here when you're looking at this, you have to add in 8K mode, you have to add another 0.8 milliseconds to be equivalent to my calc sheet. So the calc sheet takes into account what the phase delay of the internal to the gyro trip is. This is actually the, it's using the raw data from the gyro underscore scale traces which was recorded in the specific black box log and then it's you know figuring out how much phase delay basically measuring where the filter gyro is based off, off of that and then also the D term based off the filter gyro and then coming up with the total phase delay there. So that's kind of nice as you change filter setups or tweak things out you can kind of compare two things and see uh, what your phase delay, your measured phase delay not theoretical phase delay is.
Once it's done running, you can see your plots here, and it does take a little bit of time because it has to run 12 of them, so you know, be patient with it. Uh, if you wanted to see the sub 100 hertz noise, so you can click this little button here, and this basically just zooms you down to the 100 hertz line right down here, and it just zooms you into that so you can kind of see the sub 100 hertz band, because that's really where motion is, uh, sub 100 hertz, so that's an important area to look at. That's what that checkbox is for. You can also show these as 2D graphs now by clicking the 2D and it shows you more what you're used to seeing in Black Box Explorer with you know, the spectrograms in that fashion. There's different heat maps over here so you can just change the coloring of things. Uh, you can uh, smooth things more or less. That's basically how gritty this image looks. Uh, you can go over here and hit a basically a higher measurement level. So it's if you want things to speed up you can set this to subsample low uh, for larger logs and it will go faster before you hit run. Uh, if you want to, if you have a short flight and you want a little bit more higher accuracy, you can hit the subsample high. Uh, this just changes colors, so for example, I can change it to a different color here. And I can do it based off percent of throttle or percent of motor here as well. So this is all great, but what do I typically use this for? So I'll typically will run on a flight a gyro unfiltered, gyro filtered, D-term unfiltered, and D-term filtered. And when we're talking about the D-term here, you usually have to bring this scalar value up. What I usually do is bring these up to one, uh, just because the magnitude of the vibrations are a little bit higher, so it's just kind of all whited out here, if, unless you bring that up. So what are we seeing on the graph, I guess, in the first place? This is the frequency and vibration. The lightness of, like you can see this is kind of hot white, that means there's high magnitude vibration. When it's darker, that's low magnitude vibration. And then this down here is throttle percentage. So that's what we're seeing on this waterfall graph. So you can see, you know, here at uh, level L, let's just look at the raw. You can see the motor band right through here, super clear. So you can see at 20% throttle, my vibrations are around 200 hertz. And at 100% throttle, they're up around, I don't know, 500 hertz, a little bit below 500 hertz. And we can use a tool up here, this data tool again, and I can click on that and I can click on any of these. So if I click down here and click into it, and I can just see the little tool hip. So you can see that's 470, that's at 91% throttle. And the Z value is basically the amount of hotness, like how hot, how much vibration that had. And you can see up here that you have the mean and then the peak. That's what that, that's the same thing as the Z value down here. So you can kind of see a general intensity by these means and, and peaks here, uh, especially when you're comparing one log file to another log file on the same rig. I think you know that was really the main intent why there's two different file selections here. So you can make changes to your quad, kind of measure them against the defaults. You know, you have the defaults, you fly the defaults, how do those work? You think something's better, you know, what changes did I make? Is my phase delay less? Is how's my noise looking? You know, you load back up a you know your baseline file versus this new one and you kind of see it. Am I am I making some improvements here? And kind of just go down through that. Again, what I usually look at here is, uh, you know, I want to see these peaks, these, these hot reds uh, taken out by my gyro filtering. So my scheme always is, you know, take out your peak noise with your gyro filtering. The D term then just amplifies ambient noise in general. You can see that through here. It just amplifies all this high frequency stuff like crazy. And then you want to crush your high frequency noise with your D term filtering, which you can see is, is being completed over here. All this red hot stuff up here is getting taken out. Now I still have some things down low, but you know we're talking really low hertz values here. It's, it's here on the gyro as well. It's just amplified by the D term. So we're at 116 hertz. That's just a tough one to get rid of uh, on this, uh, just with filtering in general. I would try to, anything below like 150 hertz, I would really try to figure out you know mechanically how I can get rid of that. And you can see there's a little bit of a uh, spike here on this rig now. It seems like it's new uh, to it. That uh, 100 hertz peak, so you can see that peak, it's regardless of throttle position. So that's a uh, frame resonance or something's vibrating around. This is a Martian 2 frame. It's crashed a number of times. It's, it's pretty old. So anyways, I, I just noticed that starting to, to peak up and it's getting picked up by uh, obviously both of the filters here. Now another thing I look at is set point and PID error. So if you are looking at those, then I would use this less than 100 hertz checkbox here and check that for both. 
And what this shows you is where your set point is. So this is basically the stick. So this is the uh, best way to say it is the vibrations or the movement of the sticks being recorded and converted into a frequency basis. And you can see uh, just in general, this is me just moving the sticks around down here at 1 to 20% throttle. I have some stick movement going on there, and you can see it over here as well. So now this is PID error. So this is the amount of error that I have. I'm going to change this scaler back to 0.5 here to outside of set point. So when you see this graph here, and then you see, hey, there's more over here. Well, this is prop wash right here. That's what this is. So imagine anything outside of this boundary of this white area here. So that kind of superimposed over here. That's all prop wash. So then you can really microanalyze between one log and another log. This is kind of all the same. But if you had, you know, A and B, you have A over here for set point and pit error, B over here for set point and pit error, you can say, well, I, I felt like the prop wash was better. And you look at the video and sometimes you're like, man, it looks a little better. You can go into here and put the logs up against each other, kind of narrow yourself into a spot where on both flights you were doing the 180 turns or whatever that you're saying is your comparativeness for a prop wash. Do that first, then come into here, and then you can kind of look at this and say, okay, yeah, is that showing me it's better? Where is that better kind of a thing? And, and it really just gets down to the brass tacks of, now you have you know your intuition that it was better. You have uh, HD that shows it was better. Hey, and the logs are showing all the same thing. If that's a betterment, you change some settings, then it's better. Or uh, some flight firmware is better than others, or something like that. You know, this is a really a scientific way to kind of look at it. And uh, I find myself going into here just to say like, hey, was I crazy? Did I just feel good that day, or or was were things actually? better with a certain set of props versus another set or something like that. Okay, again, the next thing is pit error. So for pit error, generally you'd wanna narrow that down to a certain section of something you're trying to look at if it's flight A versus flight B. So here again, we'll just do 60 and uh, let's do 85, 60, 85. And we're gonna go into pit error, click onto that and then a dialog opens up and you can hit refresh and it will measure the pit error of one versus the other. Now these are very, you can see they're different, but they're essentially the same. And which makes good sense because it, you know, it was really the same flight. And I believe I had pretty dang close to the same settings. Up here again, you can see your standard deviation of the uh, flight A, standard deviation of flight B, so on and so forth. And then this is plotted. Basically when you're looking at this graph here, you want this to be this hump to be as narrow as possible. That means you have the least amount of pit errors. So you can see over here, this is throttle percentage. So as my as higher throttle limits, my pit error went up. Because that's usually when I'm kind of backing into prop wash and, and ramping the throttle up to, you know, 40 fit to 80 percent. And then that's where you're starting to get that that max pit error from that prop wash, especially since I'm narrowed down just on that section where I'm kind of going back and forth and doing 180 turns. Uh, as close to the same if I'm comparing flight A and flight B to each other as I can. That's kind of the issue. If you almost had a robot that could input the exact same stick moves, like precisely for a flight A versus flight B comparison, that would be perfect. So you're kind of that robot and you're not very accurate. So you're going to get some deviation just because you're not flying at the exact same. Obviously it has to be, you can't do it on a super windy day and then it's you know, stone cold uh, wind still day and compare the two things either. So there's, there's other things you gotta look at. And lastly, there is step response. So we'll go ahead and click on that. After that opens, you can hit run. Again, you can pick your methodology of how accurate you want it to be. And that really has to do with the number of samples. So if I do sub sample high, you can see it's N is the number of samples it's taking to derive this step response. So it was 27, 30, 60, so on and so forth. If I pick high, Ah, if I pick high, I got the same number. Well, why do I have the same number? And why do these look so bad? Because I still narrowed down to this very small section of flight. So I want to expand that out a little bit and then do this again. And then if you do change the zoom amount here where, where you're cutting kind of data out, the best practice is to always close these windows first, especially with the pit area, you definitely have to close the window 
if you expand or reduce the uh, purview of the log and then run that again. But I like to do the same for step response as well. Now you can see with the looking at the entire log, uh, my step responses look a little nor more normal. Uh, if I'm on medium here, I'm going to go ahead and switch that to high. You can see this is 110, 101, 263. Then after changing this to high, I have 191, 159, and 441 for the number of samples it's taking to derive uh, the step response here. And again, step response is you're moving the set point and then it's how quickly the PIDs are ramping to follow whatever set point you move to. So the easiest way to think about it is like a fast roll and we're looking at the roll axis then this is the PID responding trying to track that, that set point. Is it, you know, it's shooting up to hit the set point. Does it overshoot the set point? Then it comes back and relaxes and then does it just follow right on top of the set point here? That's what basically this is. We have some statistical data with this as well. Again, we talked about the number of samples. You can see your PIDs up here. Uh, the peak time, uh, or the peak, so it, you know, 1.05, uh, you can see that's what it is tracking along there. Uh, the peak time, 23.5 the percent of overshoot, the rise time here, which is a big one I like to look at. This is basically how quick it's, you know, this is that time from here up to here, the delta in between. So that's the rise time there. So you can have some statistical numbers here. You can kind of uh, compare one set to another and uh, see what you need to do there. Uh, you can see in the PIDs here, just by looking at this, looks like the uh, P term could be a little bit higher for the pitch access. Uh, yaw term, as always, the yaw I gains could be a little higher here, so this tracks better. One thing I have noticed, uh, the SEP response seems to make a lot more sense to me in PID toolbox versus plasma tree. Plasma T tree, generally, it looks like a mess when you look at the entire log, where the PID toolbox seems to do a pretty good job. It doesn't, you know, when I look at the, the step response here, it seems to line up with more accurately with what I'm seeing in black box just by looking at you know when somebody does a roll move and it jumps up to follow it and does it oscillate when it gets up to the top and if it does I usually will see that here oscillating as well it's just the correlation is a little tighter to what you actually see in the black box log versus uh, plasma tree so uh, Brian did a really good job on this and the statistical data is really nice to compare rise times from different settings uh, percent overshoot just to just to throw some numbers on these graphs that's all these really are derived from and do keep in mind this error this sh uh, shaded area behind here that's the culmination so some of these you know out of the 191 samples some one of those was all the way up to here and then it maybe shot down to here and that kind of a thing so you want this this shaded area to basically be as narrow as possible and then this blue line is just the average of that. If the shaded area is really thick, that means, well, sometimes it was way outside of it, and sometimes it was, you know, basically, that's your, basically that's your standard deviation. So you gotta, you know, get that narrowed down as you kind of tune things in, you can get this narrowed down. Again, as before, uh, P is pushing it up to it. D, if this is vibrating back and forth, that's not enough D term. And if this kind of is generally off, of the center that means there's not enough I term so that's how you can use that so you can see here I need a little bit more D I need a little bit more P and D term uh, so I need to increase my P term or, or use P4 to get this rise time should have probably have a little bit more overshoot here and then in general um, my my ratio to if I'm going to increase the P term I also need to increase the D term is here as well because I got a lot of bobbling around going on right here so pitch access isn't that great on this rolls rolls not too bad but uh, I haven't really tuned this. Generally, beta flight, the PIDs for a five inch, the P terms are a little low uh, in what, from what I see. Okay, that is basically it. Please do go out to the project site and go into the wiki. You can see the welcome to PID toolbox here. And Brian has a lot of great stuff, basic setup, log view, spectrum analyzer. You can click on any of these and it takes you to his instructions on how to use it and essentially what I went through. I'm sure you're going to pick up other nuggets in here in more detail. Obviously, he's the developer. He made this. I'm um, just kind of going through it based on my uses and experiences, but please do go through that and check that out. Uh, you can see there's a full write-up here of all the things and it helps you understand kind of step response and how that works. He really, uh, he just really did a fantastic job on this. I, you know, I can't thank him enough. 
um, extend your uh, gratitude to him as well. You'll usually see him on the black box uh, Facebook user group helping people out as well. Again, it's a tool to help you know kind of thread the needle on getting your quadcopter tuned up. You know, after you think you really have something that's working for you well, that's when you start black box logging it, kind of looking into that, saying, okay. How am I tracking set point? Can I make that a little bit more approved? How about I include some feed forward and you know push the values up so I can really push this quadcopter to keep on top of set point? Use the PID toolbox to as you're making some tweaks to compare flights versus one versus another, so on and so forth. Well, thanks again, everybody, and I hope this helped.